Future Cash Show. Brought to you by the Club of Amsterdam. Hey, Futurists. It's me, Miss Metaverse, and welcome back to the Future Now Show brought to you by the Club of Amsterdam. We have a great guest for you today. Joining us from Toronto, Canada is Socrates. Socrates. Hi, Socrates. How are you? Hi, Miss Metaverse. I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Yes, very excited to have you here today. So today I want to talk about the future of artificial intelligence in business. So it seems that there's a lot of artificial intelligence systems coming out of the woodwork now. And I'm curious what your take on uh, artificial intelligence is involved with the whole world of business, marketing, and, uh, and how these technologies are going to evolve in the future. Well, so, of course, when people create artificial intelligence, quite often uh, we are led or the impetus comes from the application. And the two most kind of common uh, applications for AI are uh, military purposes, which is to say uh, most of the funding comes from organizations such as DARPA, for example, or commercial interests, uh, which is to say companies trying to find a, a niche uh, and monetize it uh, by applying artificial intelligence. And examples of that are, you know, endless Google, Facebook, uh, IBM's Watson, and so on. Uh, so my kind of concern or, or kind of point of view on this issue is, is the following. Those decisions that are made in a corporate office or in a research lab are not just merely engineering, technical, or business decisions. Uh, and therefore, if you are, let's say, the CEO of, of, of IBM, and you're thinking of the best application for Watson, for example, whether it's to do big data analysis for the NSA uh, and the CIA, or uh, for a commercial application, uh, or for a medical application, like for example, cancer diagnosis, each one of those those decisions is not merely a business decision, but it's also an ethical decision. It's a decision that may have tremendous positive or negative implications down the road, not only for your company's bottom line, but for the whole of humanity. And so what I'm trying to uh, say here is that people in charge of those decisions should be aware of that and so that those implications, however far-fetched and further down the road they may look like from us, they should part, they should play part in the decision-making process. Because uh, the risk is that if we get sort of obsessive about, let's say, the bottom line and the shortest distance for making money and monetizing the product, then we're risking things like rogue AI, we're risking things like uh, militarizing AI, we're risking things like AI getting out of control and out of hand. And, and that can have can span the full spectrum from having tremendous negative implications to humanity to maybe all the way making us all extinct. And do you believe that humanity is going to come to a point where it makes more sense to hand over, let's say, more control to AIs or artificial intelligence systems because humanity might not even trust itself at one point? Because that seems to be a common theme that I've been seeing. So yes and no. So the question, so on the one hand, this has already happened. So if you, if you go fly on an airplane, uh, much of the sort of navigation is done by computers nowadays. Uh, Actually, pilots don't even fly the planes. They just take off and they land, for example, right? As soon as they're up in the air, it, it's all autopilot. And the pilot, actually, believe it or not, the human is a redundancy system, is, is to be there in the cockpit only if and when the machine stops working. Uh, and the same applies to a variety of other systems, whether it's the stock market uh, w w or many other examples, uh, driving cars, uh, uh, directing traffic, uh, controlling trains, uh, you name it. So 
as Ted Kaczynski said, and he said it 20 or 30 years ago, the machines are already in charge. Like our civilization is a technological civilization. We cannot survive without the machine. Uh, I mean, maybe we could, but we would be a fraction of the population that we are today. And there will be a g sort of giga death all over the planet if we decide to turn off the machines. So the question is not, uh, should we have the machines? We already have them. The question is, what's the best way to get the best benefit for the list of technology, but it's a, uh -oh. about what's the best technology to use. So uh, if we get that uh, kind of a mindset or a starting point, I believe we should be in good shape overall. Uh, and, and, and we have at least, while not guaranteed, we would have a much higher likelihood of reaching the future that we're hoping uh, to reach. So how do you feel that artificial intelligence systems are going to affect the future of business? So you see, my kind of point of view is that uh, my blog is about ethics. It's not about technology. Technology is just a context. And so what that means is that technology is amoral, but how we create technology how we apply it, uh, how we tweak it, uh, and towards what purposes, those are all moral decisions. And so on the one hand, we have this sort of situation where the vast majority of funding for AI currently comes either from military uh, and governments, such as, for example, DARPA, or on the other hand, it comes from commercial interests such as, and, and private companies such as Google, Facebook, IBM, and so on. But what I want to say to those people and the decision makers is that uh, let us not be obsessed and preoccupied entirely with the bottom line or with the, I don't know, battlefield efficiency and effectiveness of, of a particular weapon system. Let us sort of work through the implications of our business or military decisions down the road and see if potentially and how they can impact uh, the whole of humanity, perhaps, uh, potentially. Uh, and so uh, when we are talking about something like, for example, Watson, you can take Watson and you can apply it for big data analysis for the NSA, uh, for surveillance, uh, and you can come up with very good stuff because that's what Watson is good at. Uh, basically, Wikipedia is a database just like is the uh, the global internet or phone network. And Watson can do probably equally good job at either. But that's an ethical choice. So I, I like to invite people to consider the ethical implications and whether we do want to, to go uh, uh, that way or not. And the same applies, uh, for example, for the arming of AI. Most recently, we know there was uh, this petition uh, spearheaded by um, the institute, the new institute that was co-founded by people such as Nick Bostrom and Max Tegmark and funded by Elon Musk. And we had a number of other names such as Stephen Hawking, uh, Bill Gates, Steve Wozniak, who supported the petition against uh, arming AI. And that's basically an invitation to all researchers and scientists in the field to say, no, I'm not going to work in a field where the implication basically it comes down to killing people. Now, I don't want to suggest that business and some of those companies actually are, are, are private companies and they're businesses that cater to governments, right? Because most of the weapon systems that, that we see on uh, used today are produced by private corporations, by private businesses. So there's that kind of dimension of business that I want to all be very much aware of. Then there's, of course, uh, other, which is, uh, you know, uh, a lot less dark, if I may put it that way. And, and that's simply uh, creating AI to do uh, uh, transactions on the stock market uh, or to do uh, human analysis uh, uh, with big databases uh, for be it customer support, be it for marketing, or to do even things like, for example, neuromarketing. Uh, in other words, monitor our neurological uh, responses to either seeing visually or, or smelling a product or 
experiencing a product and then coming up with better better ways to sell us stuff that we probably don't need in the first place. So my point of view is always one of ethics and, and I'm always, and that's kind of probably preaching to the wrong choir here, but I'm just trying to ask people to think about the long-term implications of the work that they will do and the ethical and profound impacts that it would have rather than be obsessed about making money. That, and that's kind of terrible way to, to put it, but that's kind of my point of view. And other than that, there's nothing wrong to, and I believe you can have your cake and eat it too. I believe you can have good ethical business and I believe you can be an ethical scientist and create AI and have a good product where everyone's benefiting and make money and lots of it. So, and, and, and I think if we focus on it and if that's the goal we're going for, we can accomplish it rather than trying to choose the path of least resistance and just cash out in the fastest way possible. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's <laughs> so much change happening and these technologies are just evolving exponentially. Do you believe that Moore's law is going to have any meaning in the near future? Do you believe that technology is going to be doubling every two years or do you think it's just going to go way past beyond all of that? Well, there has been a lot of sort of disagreement about Moore's law since the get go. Uh, historically speaking, most of the sort of skeptics have been proven wrong, but uh, the last maybe four to five years, um, there's been a lot of uh, new skepticism. And that's uh, one on the hardware side, we can see that uh, microchip architecture has slowed down tremendously. Uh, and the gains in, on, in hardware efficiency have not been as fast uh, and, and as deep as we have uh, been experiencing before, let's say the last three or four years. Um, secondly, we may be reaching the, the point where uh, and people say that point is probably about five nanometers, uh, where we are going to have uh, so much issues such as uh, uh, you know, leakage, such as uh, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle and so on, which would make uh, the current sort of lithography based uh, microprocessor architectures uh, impossible to push further. Uh, and then that means that we're going to need a new paradigm. So to answer your question, um, I would make it two steps. I would say we can see the end of Moore's law at the current paradigm. Now, does that mean the, ends of, the end of Moore's law in general? Not necessarily, because if we have another new paradigm uh, within the next, let, the next, let's say, three to five years, we might be able to sustain it, whether it's uh, you know uh, quantum computing, whether it's photon-based computing, whether it's 3D, uh, microprocessors, or th there's a number of new graphene-based uh, processing, etc. There's a number of new things that that are showing promise right now. So I, I would say uh, anything is possible, and, and I would not be surprised. I mean, th the end of Moore's law has been predicted since its beginning, as I said, but the rumors of its de death have been usually greatly exaggerated. Uh, and I, th I would not be surprised personally if that continues to be the case. Is there anything else that you'd like to share about the future of artificial intelligence and, and business and how things might evolve? Well, I think for me, it's always the main po point is, is uh, uh, ethics. A and, you know, there's been this interesting trend in the last maybe 10 years about new kinds of entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley and in elsewhere. And some people have called them entrepreneurs with conscience, uh, which are kind of different in the sense that they are not moved by the idea of making billions of dollars necessarily, even though they do do that part very well. But they're moved equally or maybe even more so by trying to improve the world in the best way they see fit. Uh, and, and I think that's a good trend. Uh, I think it's a, it's a very important trend. Uh, I think the sort of resource-based uh, economy that we witnessed in the 19th and the 20th centuries, uh, where everything was about short-term gain uh, and about sort of cashing out, taking things to market in the fastest way possible and making as much money as quickly as possible, whatever the cost may be, are, I hope, a thing of the past. And if they're not, they should be because 
you know, as we know, our planet is is kind of at, at the edge right now. And and for example, if if um, the whole uh, global population were to live at the standard of living that we here enjoy in North America and Canada and the United States, uh, we need probably somewhere between three to five planets worth of resources to be able to sustain that. And so clearly that's unsustainable. And and so. Uh, negative things like such as negative externalities on the environment or otherwise must be taken into account and must partake in the business model of any any uh, corporate entity, I think. Because even if in the short term you're profitable, if humanity fails as, a, as an enterprise in general, no matter how your business uh, uh, enterprise, how successful it is, if Humanity.inc fails, uh, we all fail. And, and so that's kind of like, if, if I had to give one message is I would say, focus on humanity.inc uh, as much as your own specific ink, because um, we are right now kind of maybe trying to fix our cabins in the best way, way possible while the Titanic may be heading towards the, the iceberg. Uh, and, and so we have to have someone out there in the outlook looking f as far at the horizon as possible. Uh, and again, no matter how well we set ourselves up in our cabins, if we do hit the iceberg, the, the ship's going down. So we'd better be aware of, of that dimension that it's good to be nice and comfortable in your own home, but you also have to look at the at, uh, spaceship Earth. You're 100% right. I mean, it, it's so important. Thank you so much, Socrates. That was so great. I, I loved everything that you said today, and I hope that more people become more aware of the need to protect our resources and uh, find positive strategies for creating a better world. My pleasure, Kathy.